Uh, Steve Vai, welcome to Australian Musician. Nice to be here. Very nice to be here. Yeah, it's nice of you to join us because we're not so much talking about you, but um, somebody that you uh, got to know and got to play with, and that's Frank Zappa. Um, yeah. uh, there's just been a, a great new documentary called Zappa released uh, worldwide. Uh, I assume you've seen it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm in it. Yeah, I know you're in it. <laughs> what did you think of it as a whole? Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, Alex did an amazing job. He did the kind of job that you can only do if you are really, uh, really passionate about what you're working on. Yeah. Do you, do you think it touched on all, all, all the aspects that you hoped that it would? Well, it touched on well, the, the thing that it touched on that was very rare to see in any kind of a Zappa, uh, you know, presentation is the vault and some of that real early stuff. I mean, there's footage that no one's ever seen. And, you know, I used to uh, I used to go into the vault occasionally. I'd have to go in and and uh, it was just an amazing place, you know, because uh, Frank was like an audio pack rat, you know, audio video pack rat. He, he just was constantly recording things. And and I remember when um, when uh, portable cassettes came out and you were able to record, you know, like have a little portable cassette player that you take with you and just record stuff. And he was constantly recording things and, and all of that's in there too, everything. And rarely has, well, perhaps never has anyone had access to the vault, but Alex got access. So we got to see a lot of, lot of really great things that you just don't see anyplace else. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff in there that, uh we're aware that's there that still hasn't been dug out uh, apparently there's a, a jam with Hendrix in the garden which uh, we haven't found yet oh there's there's tons of stuff I mean if you can imagine if if a if a percentage of Frank's day was spent documenting something and it ended up you know in the vault after 30 40 years however long he was doing that it, it could take somebody a very long time to go through it. And I know they've been working hard to go through it, but there's stuff, it's quite the task because formats change and stuff has to be updated and upgraded and it's just hard to do. It's hard to keep up with all that. So um, yeah, there's still, still little treasures that are just buried in there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your relationship with Frank. Do you remember the moment that you heard his music for the first time? Yeah, um, I had heard the name, you know, before before that, I was interested in uh, rock music. You know, I was a teenager in the 70s and Led Zeppelin and Queen and stuff like that was really powerful for me. But before that, I, I was into composition because I, I had heard uh, West Side Story and I just fell in love with the idea. I kind of felt composition in my heart, you know, and I, I learned it at a very early age and I started to experiment with it, but no one was actually bringing those worlds together. And then all of a sudden I heard Frank and I'll never forget my friend, um, uh, Michael Bryan played me. The first thing I heard was uh, electric Aunt Jemima and tears of joy filled my eyes and then it was on to Muffin Man. I just could not believe that I was hearing this stuff because uh, it was just like one of those little treasures, you know, because it just checked off so many boxes for me. It had the, all the compositional stuff I was looking for. It was melody, Frank, Frank was heavy on melody. It had commentary, it, was, it had sarcastic edges, it was comical. And it had this ripping guitar stuff in it, you know, rip for, but it also, uh, it, it just sounded like it had a hand of freedom and control on it. You know what I mean? Like the, the control of infinite freedom. <laughs> it's, it's a good way to, you know, yeah. sum up Frank. He was completely in control of his infinite freedom and he was expressing it at all times. Yeah. And uh, and when I heard his music, I just I thought that's it. That is so beautiful. And then I realized the vastness of it, how much he had out. And at that point, I was maybe fourteen, you know. And uh, 
Uh, I think uh, the newest record at the time may, might have been, I can't quite remember, it was maybe like One Size Fits All or Overnight Sensation. And it was like just finding something in life that was like a, like a, a warm place, you know? Uh, just when you find something creative that stimulates you deeply, it's like a godsend. It feels like a blessing. And, and that's what Frank's music was like. The fact that I had the opportunity to play with him just a few short years after that, I started working for him when I was 18, was just a kind of stunning to me. Yeah. I, I believe it was when you were at Berkeley College that you heard the Black Page uh, and decided to transcribe it and send it to Frank. Um, what did you hope to achieve by doing that? Well, um, I... I loved the idea of transcribing and I started to do it uh, before I got to Berkeley. But when I was at Berkeley, I think that's when the Live in New York record came out. And when I heard the Black Page, I was just stunned because it, you know, the, the, the odd thing about Frank is everything sounded different. I mean, it was, it was carved out of the same ilk, but it was just different. The Black Page doesn't sound like anything. Chunga's Revenge doesn't sound like anything. Gregory Peckery doesn't sound like anything. You know what I mean? It, it's just as brilliant as you can get. And the Black Pages, the, the moment I heard it, I heard so many worlds come together. There was the ar arrangement of it, which was brilliant because it was a live recording that uh, had a relatively small rock band to it that he, he overdubbed and beefed up in the studio. So that's like, you know, not many people were even doing that sort of, you know, the, 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 the sound of the piece, it was the first, it was the introduction to intense, intensely complex polyrhythmic notation. And you feel that when you hear it. And Frank was like anything that he did, he was forensic about it. He, he got really deep into it. And when I heard it, I, I knew that it was completely, um, non-conventional and it's just i'm just talking now the rhythmic approach to the po the polyrhythms of the uh piece the way that he manipulated rhythmic notation was unique uh, there's one bar in the black page i forget what bar it is it's like maybe 16 or 17 where um, if you're not a musician this would be completely alien to you but he takes a bar of four four and he superimposes a half note triplet on it. So now you've got six beats. So it's like a huge polyrhythm over a full bar of four. Never saw that before. And then he goes in and he, he, he breaks up each of the two beats into other rhythmic notations and places polyrhythms inside of those. So it's, it's nested tuplets within nested tuplets, okay? So now this is intensely complex to, to, to try to play. But here's, here's the miracle. It sounds like a gorgeous piece of music. It's an inspired melody. The melody is touching in a way that is just unlike anything because it's not normal. It's not quarter notes and eighth notes, but it's not complex for the sake of being complex. You know, So it's really, a, to me and many others, that piece of music is a miracle and um, <clears throat> I was so enamored with it. I just, I, I started transcribing it. And then something very interesting happened. I met Ed, Eddie Jobson. Uh, he was in the band UK at the time and he played on the original in live in New York. He played violin on the black page, I believe. And um, I met him at a, at a, a record store. I was 18, you know, uh, 17 or something, 18. And I, I met him because at a signing and I started talking to him about this and he kind of explained a little bit about and it opened up like the whole concept of polyrhythms for me because I didn't really know what they were before that and I, it was like an epiphany and I, I had to transcribe this piece so I, I, I did my best and I, I sent it to Frank it was odd because I had the first time I spoke to Frank uh, it was on the phone I was 18, I was at Berkeley, I, I acquired his home phone number by accident, through, you know, through uh, a friend of mine that stole a Rolodex from a studio in New York City. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, and at the end of it, all these big rock stars, you know, Mick Jagger and all these names and phone numbers. And I wasn't very interested until he got to the Z's. 
And I couldn't believe it, you know, and I just started calling and I, I didn't get through to him for about a year and uh, a couple of years. And uh, when I did, he was just very nice. He was kind, which getting knowing Frank later, uh, the fact that he even picked up the phone and carried on a conversation at his from his home was was, you know, odd. Uh, but uh, I had told him that okay, my in was I knew that he was a Verace fan. And he was looking for some Edgar Verace scores. And I had access to them because Berkeley was right down the street from the Boston Public Library. And they had all sorts of scores. So I went in there and Xerox these Edgar Verace scores and called Frank and said, hey, I got these scores. Would you like them? And he's like, yeah, OK. And I, and I say, hey, can I also send you the tape of my band? You know? <laughs> and I did a transcription of the Black Page, you know, so when I told him I transcribed the Black Page, I think he kind of took a little bit of an interest. So I sent him all this stuff and I didn't think I'd ever hear anything back. And there I, I was at Berkeley and I get this package in the mail. And it's a score. Frank sent me a giant score for this piece of music he composed called Mo and Herb's Vacation. I could not believe it, it was like a big, thick, giant score for the orchestra. And then he also put a, uh, in it the Black Page, his written piece, you know, and with a note that said, make me a cassette pl of you playing the Black Page on the guitar as fast as you can play it. So I, I had this, all I had was an acoustic guitar and a, uh, a broken cassette player. <laughs> and, uh, and when he said as fast as, you know, the Black Page is a slow piece of music, like click, click, but everything on top of it is, you know, you know so uh, when he said as fast as you can play it, I just tried to, you know, get it up, as, up to speed. And then I did, I did two versions and uh, it's impossible to play, but I worked so hard on it. And uh, I sent it to him and I didn't think anything of it. And then I, 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 somebody showed me this article, an interview that he did in a magazine in San Francisco where he was talking about me. And that I had never even seen my name in print. <laughs> and there was Frank Zappa saying, there's this kid from Berkeley, his name is Steve Vai. He played the black page. I, re I think he's gonna turn into something. You know, he's really got incredible chops and, and he's going on and on. And I'm just thinking, this is remarkable. I can't, I couldn't believe it. And um, I thought he was just being nice, but that wasn't Frank. Frank never, never placated. I mean, if he placated somebody, his tongue would fall out of his head, you know? It just, he never did. He never said anything unless he felt confident about it and, and pretty sure. I didn't get to know that until later, you know? Uh, but that's pretty much, you know, for me, the story of the Black Page. Yeah. Uh, you played with Frank uh, for a couple of years. Was there a gig that stands out in your mind? Oh, there was many. Um, but uh, so I started transcribing for Frank when I was 18. And I, he wanted to try me out for the band. But when I told him I was 18, he, you know, he said, you're too young. So when I was 20, I moved out to California and started going, moved down the street from him and started going up to the house and recording and that kind of thing. And then we, I was invited to tour and uh, so many great gigs. One gig, this was the roughest gig I've ever, I'd ever played in my life. I actually was asked this question and there's a funny video of me explaining it, but it was in uh, uh, Austin, Texas at the Armadillo World Headquarters. It was the last show that they were having there. And as you know, Frank did Bongo Fury and recorded it at the Armadillo World Headquarters. And uh, so they were closing this place and they asked Frank to close it, right? It was, we did two shows. It was 115 or 120 degrees on the stage. And I was sick as a dog. You know, I was just terribly ill. And I, I, I was just vomiting and the runs and everything and I and I was on stage with a pair of cut off jeans and that was it and they I was wheeled out on a you know one of those gurneys and I remember just having to concentrate to even just turn my head to play you know and I got through the gigs but that that was rough you know that was really rough but there was so many great shows you know Frank never did the same show right he would he would 
we'd had we'd had about 80 songs that we had to know which was deftifying you know and um he would write the set list right before we went on stage every night it was different every night and you just never knew what he was going to do you had to like completely you I, I mean i forget there was an audience because you have to be bulletproof focus on frank at all times and he heard everything he heard everything <laughs> yeah so was he able to enjoy the band's performances or was he constantly analyzing analyzing yeah uh, he was very critical because he was always trying to improve it and he he heard everything, but I think at times he you can you can tell when he, I think what he enjoyed the most was the actual compositional process, and there's some footage in Baby Snakes where you can see Frank in his compositional element with the rock band, and that was so much fun when he whenever he would do that and he'd do it every day you know you go into rehearse most of rehearsals Frank was just building building changing laughing you know he'd do things to laugh at you know it was just fantastic and his you know i guess his biggest um probably his biggest obstacle was the limitations of the musicians because he would always try to get them to go further but the the brilliant thing about frank was um his ability to see your potential and to pull it out of you in a very uh, in a setting that was unique because most people that most of the musicians that I even knew that worked with Frank you have to have something that he could use as a you know as a color in his musical creative palette and I had something the thing that I had was for some reason I was able to play these weird melodies and stuff on the guitar so he I was a good um, ingredient, you know, um, but uh, I think he, he enjoyed the creative process more than just the listening. Yeah. Well, what guitar and amp were you mainly using with Frank and did he care about the gear that other band members were using? Well, it had to sound a particular you know, way. I used my Strat that I got when I was a kid uh, for pretty much the whole thing. I only had one guitar, uh, but then I, I, I got another guitar as a backup, but I used Frank's um, Hendrix Strat as a backup in case, you know, if I, if I broke a string or something, he let me use that. I, did, I, I mean, I used it several, a bunch of times. I, I used it on Zombie Wolf every night, but um, I was very inexperienced when it came to tone because I never could afford a good amplifier. I never really, I gave precious little attention to tone. So, I mean, I remember my first, uh, my audition with Frank. Uh, wait, was it my audition? It was, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, it was after the first show that I ever did with Frank. I met him in the uh, the restaurant of the, hotel in the morning and having breakfast and I said so how was I you know <laughs> and he said to me you know Steve uh I think you're a, a really good musician but your tone sounds like an electric ham sandwich <laughs> <laughs> and I said well why I mean I've got the Strat I've got the Marshall you know and he goes well the tone this this is profound and it's true and I've used it my whole life i go into great detail but frank would never but frank rarely went into detail he would just say things and then you, it, they were unequivocal you know what i mean so uh, he said um the sound isn't in the amps it's in your head now now at first i didn't know what he meant by that i thought it was just some esoteric cool thing to say but it, it wasn't until later and, you know, a little later on that I realized, yeah, that's that's exactly where your tone is. It's, it cannot be any other place. You know, you it's going to it's going to sound the way you're expecting it to sound. It's kind of hard to explain. And then you'll manipulate it to get it to where you want it to sound. But I gave very little attention to that. But I gave little attention to a lot of things until I joined Frank's band. And then I 
focused intensely on various things through his tutelage, you know? Yeah. Um, an Australian composer and keyboard player, Alan Zavod, played with um, Zappa in 84. Uh, Alan was a friend of mine and a, a good, a great contributor to our magazine. Um, did you come across Alan at all or were you gone by then? No, I was gone. And um, I had met him very briefly when I came to visit uh, a rehearsal. Yeah. yeah. So um, obviously Zappa fans will get a lot out of this docu documentary. Um, uh, people who aren't into Zappa or haven't heard Zappa, why should they go and see this documentary? Well, you know, Frank is the, like any other artist if it resonates with you, you've, you've discovered a treasure for life, especially with an artist who was as prolific as he was, because he has a tremendous body of work, tremendous. It's like over well over a hundred albums of high quality music. You know, it's not just jams, you know, and um, there is a vast creative freedom in Frank's music, and it's inspired by his, by his unique inner ear, melodic inner ear, and his sense of humor, and the things he likes and the things he doesn't like. And as a consumer of music, it, it, there's a, a plethora of, of artists and genres and different kinds of music that you can embrace. But there's nothing like Frank, you know. It's you know, you can say, yeah, the Rolling Stones fit into kind of this category and Led Zeppelin kind of fits into that category and Stravinsky fits into this and Weyburn into that and so and so. But Frank was, it sounds, it sounds cliche, but he, I wouldn't say he broke the mold because there was no mold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was no mold to break. He was, he was um, autonomous in his creativity in that regard. Yeah. Um, have you got a couple of minutes just to talk about some general Steve I stuff? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I was at your uh, press conference at NAM when you launched the uh, PA guitar. Um, and I was going to ask you a question, but you had to run off to um, soundcheck for the gig that night. Um, at what point did your wife, Pia, become aware that the guitar was going to be named after her? <laughs> Well, yeah, it's funny. My wife, we, we, she knew Frank very well too. We, we we've been together since Berkeley, and she's not so into the you know she doesn't care. She, she tries to stay very private. Uh, but I like I've always liked her name and the word. And when I had started to come up with different ideas for the guitar, as soon as the pedal design clicked, I just it, there was a connection there. You know, and for some reason, I just it, uh, I just thought of her and I said, the name of this guitar is the Pia. Of course, I had to run it up the flagpole, <laughs> you know, and that was uh, and then I, I took it to her and I said, I want to name this guitar the Pia. She's like, no, you can't name it the Pia. You know, I wouldn't name it the Pia. What do you kid? People don't want, you know, and I'm like, well, that's what I want to do. <laughs> you know, and she's like she warmed up to it and now she thinks it's very sweet. <laughs> Yeah, uh, at the virtual NAM this year, they released a, a nice uh, oh, flat, flat black virtual. <laughs> there it is. Man, this guitar, look at that. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, this is the new one that came out, the Onyx Black. Yeah. So uh, are there some more uh, models and colors in mind? Uh, yeah, eventually, you know, uh, the, the first year we had the four, the white and the uh, the three different colors. And that was the three colors were just for that year. Yeah. The first year. And the black is probably just for this year. Yeah. And we get some other, you know, a lot of other. It's great uh, to work with Ivan as they're very creative. They have a great creative team and we love doing crazy stuff like this. Yeah. All right, Steve, uh, I've been told we, we need to wrap up. It's been great to chat and uh, hopefully we can talk again soon because I know you've got a lot of great music coming out. So uh, Thank thanks for joining us. Thank you. And and for everybody watching, check out the movie. It's the Zappa yeah. movie. It's really great, really great. Thank you.